all the data on your phone are not of the same value. All the pictures that you take on your phone are not of the same value. There are some pictures that you don't care whether you lose it or not. There are some pictures that are very personal that you don't want everybody to see. There are some pictures that you can share with people. There are pictures that you can share with people. There are pictures that you can share with family. There are pictures that you cannot share with the entire world. So that is that means you have putting classification on those pictures that are on your phone. The same thing happens in assets. If you come, if you have a fleet of cars, let's say you have five different cars. You have a Maserati, you have a Mercedes, you have a Toyota, and then you have a Jag, and then you have a Pinto, or you have one car that you know, doesn't care. You have priorities over them. There are places that you want to drive one to and places that you don't want to drive the other two. These are classifications based on the value of the assets. The same thing happens in data. When you have various data that are being produced in an enterprise environment, there are different classifications that comes in play as those data are being, are being created. One of which is sensitive data. So in the public sector, you can see some companies, once it gets up to four or beyond four, it starts becoming uh, a nuisance. But between one and four, we have different classification. One is public data. A public data is a type of data that you can share with anybody. You can put it, these are like um, a yearly record, quarterly report that you put out there for everybody to see how good the company is doing. If anything happens to that data, if anybody touches it doesn't mean anything to you because it's a public information it's out there then there are some data that you that are internal data that you share only in your intranet environment not your internet your intranet environment that is only used within the office these are documents that you use for business you know that you don't want to be a public to, to be in the public domain then we have confidential information these are data that are to be used by specific people, okay, for business and has no reason to be known by everybody. And then we have restricted. These are like intellectual properties. These are the core things that makes the business what it is. Uh, these are things that just maybe the CEO and a few other people knows about, like your family recipe that you use in whipping that pepper soup that nobody knows. That's your intellectual property. And it becomes a restricted use of data. It's not something, sometimes people don't even put it online. It is a traditional hard copy that is written on a diary that is about 100 years and is put away in a safe and nobody knows what is in there, things like that. That's your intellectual property, okay? Now, restricted high confidential data are, these type of data are things that can, I, in, in this industry, this is the type of data that we protect. These are intellectual properties. These are personally identifiable information. Two classic examples within the IT security are personally identifiable information and protected health information, or EPHI, electronic protected health information. When you go to the hospital and you give up your information, when you apply for credit card and you give up your information, when you apply for, for college and you give up your information, these are personally identifiable information. And a personally identifying information is when one or two information can be combined to identify an individual. Like your date of birth and your driving license would definitely give out who you are. So all this information are classified as confidential or restricted use. And their classification will now make the type of control to apply to them be very much severe. We have to put the severity of them determines that type of control we apply to them. Any question? While in the military, they use top secret, secret, and confidential. 
in the public domain, we use public, internal, confidential, or restricted use. And that is the same thing that we talked about. Now let's talk about system development life cycle. What is system development life cycle? Everything in life that we use have a life cycle. Everything that we do follows a pattern. The same thing happens with hardwares that we buy for, for businesses, softwares that we buy for businesses, products that we produce during the processes of business, like data that we produce, they have from the creation, I think is, um, CSUSAD, create, store, use, share, archive, and destroy. Okay. Something like data. Data follows six different life cycle. When you create a, data, a, a file, the first thing that you do is to store it by saving it so that you can keep updating it and reusing it. Okay. And the next thing that you could do is maybe send it to someone to share it for collaboration or for integrating it into other application or other software or other documents. And then at the point, the use of that data becomes a little stale and you need to store it in case if you need to use it again, then you archive it. Then in that archive process, you put it away. In that archive process, you put it away for a period of time until when it's needed. Next time that is needed, you bring it back and reuse it. But after, after a while, like the data that is being collected in the hospitals, there's a duration of time that, you, that those that collect them has to keep them, at least six to seven years, I think. And after that, you are eligible to destroy those data because keeping it by then, after then, it is meaningless and it becomes a waste of resources protecting such data that are not useful. So the destruction part is when you now discard and destroy either shred, if it's a physical thing, or the gaussing or however that you destroy it either electronically or physically in order to destroy the data and also there are laws that mandates the amount of data that you have to collect per person okay uh when you are collecting information you don't collect unnecessary things that you're not going to use asking somebody their their mother's date of birth when it is not necessary for the information that you are collecting or for the purpose of what you're trying to use it for. It's against the law to do that. So system development life cycle talks about the process that we take in acquiring software or hardware. For example, your phone. Before you get a new phone, you decide, okay, if you're an iPhone person, you decide whether you're gonna get the latest of the latest or you go down for uh, one that is a lower that is lower based on your budget. All these things are the initialization process. Okay, that initialization process, you are considering which one is better, or should I switch to Android, or should I just not use a phone? Should I get a flip phone? Should I get a, a, a whatever thing that you want to get, or not get one at all? A typical SDLC includes five phases. You have the initiation phase, and then you have the development and acquisition phase. You have the implementation and assessment phase, operation and maintenance phase, and then the disposal phase. In the initialization phase, that's when you now decide, when you are deciding what to, to acquire, whether to get it or not. And then after that, you now do the acquisition. That's when you purchase the phone now or the car that you want. If it's in software development, it is when you now start developing that particular software. And then when you 
or when you acquire the software itself or the hardware. Now you do the implementation is when you install it. The installation is also geared towards it's performing the function that it's intended to. And then you have to assess to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do in your environment. Then you leave it to do what it's supposed to do. That's the operation. But within that operation period that you're using the phone, you need to maintain that phone. You need to update it. You need to make sure that the screen guard change it. You change it when it starts being warped or when it starts warp, warping or when the glass breaks, you need to change it. All these things are part of the maintenance phase. Update the OS, update the applications that runs on it. After a while, you need to dispose of this hardware or the software. You need to either the company that is making that has released a new state of the art and you want to get that or they have discontinued supporting the old one and there's a vulnerability on it or you just want a new one. Now you need to dispose of the old one. But this disposal process has to follow a systematic way. You don't just discard it. Your phone, you don't just give your friend or your brother your phone without taking out your personal information that's on it. The same thing applies to hardwares and softwares, uh, especially hardwares. That's why sometimes you find devices that are, that are pre-used and you won't find a hard drive because they've taken the hard drive out and destroyed it. So you need to buy your own hard drive and put in it. So dispose All right. Now, risk management framework, which is cybersecurity risk management framework. Uh, this, um, this, has, this was actually instituted in 2002. Uh, this is the year that the United States federal law enacted the title three of the e-government act of 2022. Uh, published publication 107347. You don't need to know all this. Uh, it's called the FISMA Act of 2022. The reason why I'm touching this is some of you that are in in the government area like Virginia, North Carolina area, you might be getting some government related uh, jobs. So you need to understand what FISMA is. And in the exam that you're taking, you will also see FISMA.